All right, Seda. So this is we we this is a like a couple years worth of of collaboration kind of culminating today. Yeah, all all of the conversation that we've had at hometown. Yeah, and so it's this is it's kind of surreal to be honest with you. I'm and actually at the place where you showed your documentary too, which we will talk about once we actually get going. Let me give you all a tour while we wait. We're here in the gallery place at Shopkeepers. We do have a art show that's kind of informally up. It's still in the works, but this is Christian's work. This is called The Hug. Um, and then Morio, if you all have been following on Instagram, she created an engagement scene to kind of inspire you all to make your altars at home. She has some work up here as well. So let me give you, it's like I'm giving you a little gallery tour, so. There's a little bit of a light. That's right, and they're all for sale. Hashtag not sponsored. I'm just, just showing you all. Some stuff going on here. So, and behind me, I have my altar that my, uh, my partner took a, she, I will say, she took the lead on making this and it's a fascinating thing because a lot of the process of what we're doing today is talking about cross-cultural like altars, but also recognizing that for some people that don't grow up with this tradition, there's kind of like an artistic void that is kind of get, getting filled so that you can confidently feel like you can make an altar without needing to appropriate somebody else's culture. And in many ways, artists are the people that help give you that vision as to like, how you can express like the feelings inside you and so like for me i didn't grow up with this tradition and so with each kind of like manifestation in each year i'm getting like a greater like clarity as to what my altar and everything can look like and so um it's a really it's a it's a an evolutionary process for me it's figuring out what to make and my partner is Mexican American, so she has a whole cultural tradition. And so it's a fairly traditional looking Mexican altar with a, a lot of black people on it. <laughs> we have um, Les, who's also uh, part of, the, of Sama Sama, a co-curator. She normally uh, creates a really awesome soundtrack for us for these events that, um, you know, creates a little bit of an ambiance and helps us kind of create, set these time barriers for us as we like, right, as we lead it into actually starting the event. So don't mind us, we're just kind of chit-chatting while we give people some more time to log in. But yeah, why don't you tell us about your altar then? Because you actually aren't on here revealing your altar. So since we have some time, why don't you walk through? Me? Yeah. Okay, yeah, so, so this, altar andrea made the altar and so it's very traditionally like mexican a lot of dia de los muertos stuff but the photos are of my family and she'll be adding her her photos on it you know over the course of celebrations but i'll i'll bring i'm gonna bring one photo down and i'll, I'll tell a story about the about this person because it's like that's the point of a lot of this oh, so, all right, everyone, this right here is really cool. So see this photo, this person right here is my ancestor, DJ Mac, okay? This photo was probably taken in like 1880, which just crazy to think about. And so here's the story about DJ Mac. I found, I learned about him I don't know, six, seven years ago, more, because I have an uncle who decided to like do a, a, a lot of research on our family history. And this process of him doing all this research kind of helped me get into Day of the Dead because I started focusing on my ancestors more and more. But DJ Mack, he, he was born in 1863 and his mom was an enslaved woman named Charlotte. They lived in South Carolina. And his father 
was a white guy named George Washington Bird who owned the plantation. And so that he was the illegitimate son of a, of a, of a slave and a plantation owner. And his mom was one fourth of black. So DJ was one eighth. And so when he was born, he was so light that he passed as a white person. And his father died fighting for the Confederacy. And so when he, when DJ was born, for some reason, this white guy's wife, Miss Mary, decided to raise DJ as her own son. And so DJ growing up thought he was a white person until he was about 15 years old. And then the secret came out and he, what, it was revealed to him that, he was, a, that he, he was black. And so then he had to live a whole new life. And so before, he, when he was a white person, his name was James Bird. And then when he, had to, when he realized he was black and everyone knew and found out, he changed his name. We believe it's, it was, his official name is Dr. James, so just DJ. And the last name Mac, I'm not sure exactly where Mac came from, but from that point on, the whole Mac lineage of my family was born. And so it's this fascinating family narrative of like, we were undocumented black people where like the only tra knowledge that people existed was like, literally like build a sale with like the name of a slave without a last name. And then for like 15 years, we were white people. And then from that point on, we've been black people. And it's like, that is just the wildest thing. And it, it, the amount of stuff you think about of how that can change the trajectory of your family. Like, you know, my family, education has been a really big part. And we have, you know, there's, my family has a lot of smart people. Uh, just, it's just how it is. Um, but like, like it is. <laughs> okay. it, but I, I, it's just one of those funny things. But sometimes I think about if like the formative years of DJ's life where he was educated as a white person who was the son of a plantation owner in the South, like did maybe, did that like, did he get more education during that time during reconstruction than a lot of other black people might have gotten? And did that n knowledge and, uh, you know, exposure of like the white world and the black world, like how much that influence like generations of like his kids. It's like, it's just so many things that you can think about from like this one story and how it manifests, you know, like a, a weird thing to even think about is I wonder what his perception of black people was when he was confident he was a white person. Like, I really have no idea what it is. I, you know, it could be absolutely anything, but like, it's a question that you're gonna ask that you wouldn't even think of asking unless you knew this story. And so, so my uncle Artie is just obsessed with, with our history. And so he, he did all this research and, and like also like within our family, we don't talk about the, this 15 year window of like whiteness that's not like there's not like it's not like we can claim it it's not like we're like oh we're, we're white or something like that's not because we're clearly not but it's it's this weird component of like american existence that we as a society aren't that comfortable talking about but like one thing that's really neat is like i know this but day of the dead kind of gives me a like a platform to just tell this just mm normal story of my family to other people without it being overly complicated or having like an agenda or anything. It's like, this is just like, this is a photo of a black family from the 1880s. And this, this person right here at one point in his life thought he was a white person. These people, they were always black, but there was a, a, a you know, clearly he wanted to, there was a, d a desire to like, have a darker skinned wife to make sure that his kids had no ambiguity as to like what they were, that they would, they wouldn't be like in the middle. It's like, no, no, we're definitively black from here on out. And that's just how we are. And like, we're proud of being black and we're going to, you know, but like, that's just a fascinating story. So this is, so I remember DJ, he's on our altar and, uh, and yeah, and there's a bunch of other people on here, but that's, that's one of the stories that, uh, I mean, 
you grew up in your household where, like you said, uh, you know, your parents talked and, you know, I remember you told me that your parents are also a journalist. And so you grew up in an environment where you spoke about these things. Do you feel like every point in your life as you grew up from a child to your teenage years to now in the work that you're doing, that's kind of your, your thoughts about your ancestry has evolved? Oh, hundred percent. Like it's not, it's they've, there's, they've evolved in that there's more knowledge, but also I think the key thing is as you get older, I think like when you're a kid, there's a certain time where you just imagine yourself as being able to do what your parents do. But then you become old enough and you start imagining that you're going to do stuff that your parents never did. And some, for some people, maybe that happens when they're 10 and some people it's, you know, 20, but at some point you have to imagine what you can do in the world that extends beyond what your parents do. And if you, a great way to be, have confidence in that is knowing what other people who are connected to you have done so that you can, you can have that attachment. Like, you know, for many people, it, it could be like, there's a professional athlete that's, you know, African-American. And now I believe that I can be good at this or, or an African-American who's like a lawyer or whatever. But at the same time, it's, it's, it's also your family's really important. So I remember when I was trying to, you know, make my way in the world, knowing more about the many people. And also like my family has a lot of people in it. Like, like my grandfather was, he had eight kids and he was one of 12 or 13. And it's like, just think of all the people. And that's just all my grandfather. I got, you know, I got a grandmother and another, you know, other side. And so there's just so many people that if you just like know a lot about your history, you kind of get like another layer of confidence that you can do things because there's a, there's someone in the past who probably looks like you or had something similar to you and they did something cool. And now you say, Oh, I can do that too. And so I think that's, that, that's probably like the, the biggest evolution where you kind of, you have more confidence in your capacity to do stuff in the world because you have a connection to people who have done things and have aspired to do things and whatnot. And so that's, I think that's the evolution where it's, it's more of a, I, I view stuff really in a, like a practical way sometimes. And it's like, this is just a very practical need to have this evolution of your ancestors where they can empower you to do things. Uh, just by knowing that they exist or existed or still exist in spirit in your mind and stuff. Yeah, I mean, okay, so I think um, we can go ahead and really officially get started. Um, now that uh, we've given some people some time to actually log in. So hello again, thank you all for joining in today. I know it's a Saturday and it is COVID and there's not a lot of things going on, but it is a weekend where it's, um, People are still kind of doing their thing, spending time with their family. So thank you for joining. Uh, this is going to be a three-day series for the Altars Festival. I'm Sita from Samasama, and Barrett will introduce himself from the, State, the Sustainable Culture Lab. And we'll, speaking, we'll be speaking for our organization today and kind of moderating and co-hosting together. But I'll kick off with um, just who we are and how we kind of came to create these, this three-day series together and what we hope to get from it and we, what we hope you all will take away from it. Uh, the Altars Festival really stemmed from um, some conversations and getting to know Barrett and his project where uh, we, were, we ran in, into each other at a... Um, at the Eaton Hotel where I had hometown, the new stand, and I got to learn a little bit more about his work and he kind of talked about um, the Alters documentary that he was working on. And again, I'll let him uh, talk a little bit about that and he'll actually show you a clip of that documentary, but it was, it did, it was inspired by Dia dos Muertos. And for me, it reminded me a lot of Jumban, which is a holiday that Cambodians celebrate. Um, and the whole point was um, just, celebrating our ancestry and our heritage and creating space for that and the formality of what these holidays really give to us kind of like what you're saying uh, yes we're celebrating we're together but to really create a formal space for it um gets us to actually think and reflect back on a much deeper level so with sama sama um what we really wanted to do is um kind of work with artists uh, because barrett had said hey what's a great way to get people um, more involved and in, uh, get, get a 
deeper understanding of what the altars project is and so obviously we said you know um artists would be a great way because you know they are the philosopher of time of our times they really can kind of visualize what it is that we're all feeling and thinking and uh contextually um it, it's such a reflection of our time and space and our culture so when we reached out to our artists um you'll be seeing um, them reveal their altars in the next a couple days and two will be for today two will be for sunday and two will be for the following monday so please continue to rsvp and join in on that um, but what we realized that there's going to be three points that we wanted to hit to kind of um, create a broader connection to the concept of altars and it's sort of what we why we created the themes for the next three days is sort of like a past present and future so the past for what we're doing today is the theme of ancestry and heritage um, and really kind of paying honor to our ancestry and our family uh, and that's an important part because it's about traditions and the foundation of who we are you know if, if you all were here a little bit on the earlier side and to hear a little bit of barrett's um kind of digging in and sharing about his family and his identity and really reflecting where that has brought him today and an understanding of himself and where you know how that has influenced his work those are those foundations that kind of make such a difference into our participation and who we are um to this cultural landscape but um that's what we're doing and we're really excited and you know by no means i will just kind of throw this out there we're not here to say that um this is how you need to make an altars or um this is how we want you to celebrate the, the point is that we're really just sharing space and hopefully giving you that time to actually reflect and and inspire you to do so we're not here because this is what we all do for a living when it comes to creating altars and speaking on the holidays um, but really just take that time to really think about all the already existing indigenous holidays that exist um, like i said for me i connect with Jomon, and then you know growing up here in america we all know about dia de los muertos and all of the very um you know bigger meanings behind it than just a fun holiday of what we learn in school we'll make a mask like there's everything about it you know there's symbolism into every part in of of these um practices and rituals so but yeah so no, i i think that was a a great intro seda and i i just have to intro that seda has just been like a wonderful like friend and collaborator on this for a couple years now and i just really appreciate all of her help throughout this entire process and like literally this started she has a new stand at the eaton hotel and i would pop in because she has really cool magazines and we would just like chat about stuff and i told her the project i was working on regarding day of the dead and she said you should screen your trailer at my shop and i was like i would love to screen my tra my trailer at your shop and so we did it and it went really really well and we've been collaborating and talking about this ever since and so like for me the my my partner andrea we went to a uh she invited me to a Day of the Dead celebration and I had never gone to anything like it before. And at first, you know, I didn't have any idea what to expect. I hadn't done it. Um, but I immediately saw that it gave people an opportunity to cope with loss and strengthen your community and celebrate your culture. And this was just something that at scale, like America just didn't have. Like there were definitely, you know, certain like within the african-american community there'll be a tradition in one part of america and a different tradition in another part but there's nothing that like we are all doing at the same time that connects all of us even though it, but the things that do connect the black community in many ways is like speaking out against the systemic trauma that happens to our culture you know like black lives matter is an example of that and we have a tradition of making altars in many ways that's in response to something tragic happening and I thought about how if we make altars to remember people after something tragic happens, then we're not really necessarily getting ahead of the problem. Like we're responding to something bad already happening. And so is there a way to get this and make it proactive and not, you know, a little reactive? And I thought that Day of the Dead and like the, having like a, like a date on the calendar where all these traditions that exist within the African-American community, but also 
or within the Mexican American community, but then there's a whole slew of other immigrant communities that have similar traditions that they will be that they do on separate days. If we can proactively do this once a year, now we're creating something completely new and different that can empower people quite a bit and make sure that you know people of color have have a have an, a greater voice in our society. And so, like to a certain degree, like I first. And I'm a, a, a philosopher, I think a lot. I've been told I need to get out of my head and into my heart and I gotta I actually like practice doing that. But like, I, I had like an um, initial like heart response to the, the ancestor remembrance tradition that I saw within the Mexican American community. And uh, I wanted to be able to equitably share my culture in that space too and allow them to like share their culture in my space because we all, we live side by side, like the black and brown people agree on so many things in the US and we're neighbors more often than not. And so we need to figure out a way to like share our culture together in a way that appreciates culture and doesn't appropriate culture. But once you start that conversation, now it's, there's so many other cultures that are our friends that we need to like create space for them too, so that they can also have something on an altar that is, you know, let's say, let's say like Cambodian, but talks about COVID-19 or it talks about Black Lives Matter, something that's American that is impacting a lot of people to show that you care and you're part of like a shared community. And so I really just had been thinking about this for a very long time and I was articulating it and coming up with this idea and talking to people and eventually became pretty evident that words can only do so much and you have to have artists and creatives that like the idea like the philosophy so that they can then come and manifest this in some visual way that allows people to see it and not have to listen to me talk to them for five minutes or ten minutes and you know there's another way to impact people and be persuasive and show what we're doing and so um that's in many ways what this is all about. And it, I, for me, it also reminds me that, you know, my mom is a, my mom is creative and she used to paint, but I, that's a latent skill of mine. And so I kind of rely on the artists that Seda and Les at Sama Sama have brought in for this practice to like inspire me to come up with ideas on how I can cultivate my altar. Cause for many of us, um, you know, my, my work at SCL, we talk about this word ethnocide a lot, which is the destruction of culture and keeping, while keeping the people. And America is like built on that. Like the transatlantic slave trade was an agenda of doing that where you're trying to discord, colonizers want to destroy the culture of African people, but keep their bodies and then build a society around this perpetual division based around cultural destruction. And that what that means is like a lot of us don't have the foundation or the, the, the tradition for our culture that we would want. And we kind of have to start anew or learn from immigrant communities and other people and their culture to like build the stuff that we want to build to have a, have an equitable and empowering culture. And so, you know, you know, there's things that I need to learn and learn from artists so that I can help manifest my own, you know, the ideas I'm working on. And so this is actually like a process that I hope is beneficial for other people, but it's incredibly beneficial for me too. Yeah, I think, I think the, the beauty about um, showcasing and highlighting the artist's interpretation of an altar and how it can inspire us is that we don't have to feel so stuck in a box of what that could, that type of tradition and ritual for me. Um, and that you can really take space to what what you choose to take from that, without the with the, with and addressing that concern of disrespect potentially or moving out of that space that may take away. Because I think like the whole point is taking the spirit of what these rituals and traditions mean um, to kind of you know remember at least just the point of what we hope to kind of accomplish for today as we move into tomorrow is again kind of reflecting back on some of those traditions and 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 that you know if you don't feel like those really call to you you know make sure that you are you take the spirit of of what that tradition is supposed to mean and what and how that is um 
really allows you to find that space to think about where you come from. Um, and, you know, I've, I've had some people who have said to me that, well, I do actually, you know, celebrate life and death uh, when there is a passing of a loved one. You know, we get together with family and it's like, exactly. But imagine if America had an actual holiday that wasn't just like somebody passed and we go to a funeral. You know, what would that actually mean to how we value human life in this country? Um, so, you know, that's just kind of um, what we hope to accomplish and, you know, plug in those like food for thought type of type of pieces. So, so oh, I think, didn't mean to interrupt, but, you know, but to keep on schedule, how I'll share the, the pitch video and I'll share a couple of my videos and then we can kick it to, to CJP. Does that right. sound good? Exactly. So uh, Barrett is going to be showing the, his, his piece of his documentary, and that is really um, what has kind of inspired him. And then it's turned into here in the Altars Festival. Yeah. So I'm going to share my screen and then I'll show you uh, this, this one video and then I believe another video after that. So uh, let me. And if anybody has any questions or comments, feel free to drop it into the chat. Okay, so hopefully we can do this. Writer and journalist Barrett Holmes Pittner, and this is Alters, my groundbreaking documentary film about creating a cross cultural Day of the Dead celebration. Last year, I had a death in my family, and Day of the Dead provided the structure and support I needed to cope with the loss. This tradition helped me heal, and for the first time, I could see how it could help my family and others outside the Latino and indigenous communities. Mainstream America has nothing like this, and we desperately need it. Day of the Dead was created by the Aztecs and Mayans thousands of years ago, and many other indigenous cultures from around the world have created similar rituals and traditions. These practices help people cope with the trauma of death while also bringing people together, strengthening their communities, and celebrating their culture. For years, my Mexican-American friends have welcomed me into Day of the Dead, Dia de los Muertos, as they build altars to celebrate and remember family and loved ones who have passed on. As an African-American and a journalist who has written about Black Lives Matter, Charlottesville, the shooting at Emanuel AME Church, and so much more, I know how beneficial incorporating this tradition into the African-American community will be. It will create a new and unique opportunity to proactively strengthen and enrich our own rituals, remember black life, and celebrate black culture, all while building bridges with other American communities. I need your support. Help me as I travel around the country and the world collaborate with artists, churches, and families to build cross-cultural altars and conduct interviews while I film the entire thing. Now is the perfect time to build new American traditions that elevate our voices and bring us together. Become part of something powerful. Thank you for watching my video, and thank you for your generous support. Uh, Barrett Pete pre-COVID here. <laughs> yeah, I was way I was way trimmer uh, on the facial hair at that time. Uh, I think a lot now. Um, so that video worked. Like audio, everything was fine. It was good. Okay, so I'm gonna do one more video, and this is my parents doing Day of the Dead for the first time at at our house. So let me get this one queued up, and I'll share it uh, real quick. One second. Da -da -da. Uh, oh, nope. One second. Here we go. Sorry about this, guys. Here we go. Now, screen sharing, and we're ready to go. Do, 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 do. Yeah. 
it would be good because it's something that they can learn. Lots of time people don't think they can learn something from another culture. I think it's a very good um, concept, a, join, a joining of two groups, two minority groups, as a matter of fact, in the United States, I think it could make it even stronger because of all of us coming together. And what I hope is it becomes a national thing every year that we celebrate the Altars Project here in the United States. Well, it definitely would benefit because all our um, rituals were ripped away from us. And I, I think we need a new one. I think very few tend to go to counselors and uh, discuss things that are bothering them. Bothering them. And this could be another avenue that could be taken to release the emotions and get rid of the grief. The receipt of Daniel Pratt, seven hundred dollars for a Negro mulatto boy named Charles, which bore our warrant, sound and healthy and a slave for life. The title to which bore our warrant against all claims, said boy is about thirteen years old. This thirtieth day of March. 1843, Samuel Griswold. Received of Mr. Daniel Pratt $1,800 in full payment for a Negro girl, Eliza, aged 19, and her two children, little girls, coming four and two years old, which I warrant sound in body and mind, and in titles and slaves for life. Uh, March 2nd, 1859. Amos Senior, Smith Senior. So many people being killed, everybody being afraid, and I'm tired of people being afraid. And I want it to be a celebration of the people that we've lost, that we remember them, that we always love them. And I think this will help people to learn how to mourn and how to celebrate and not spend so much time being so sad. Learning how to handle something that will uh and enhance your own being is something that would be beneficial. I haven't uh, been practicing this, but uh, this could be the start of something that uh, I could learn and possibly pass on to friends and acquaintances. I like to tell people, if this person loved you before they died, they'd still love you after death. And you don't have to be afraid about anybody that you love that has died. You're not going to hurt. All right. Thank you for sharing that. Thanks. Yeah. So those were the some of the videos we did to start this project and, you know, COVID and all sorts of stuff has made it difficult to finish the film, but we've expanded and adapted the work and this project, this festival, collaborating with Sama Sama, bringing in the artists, have evolved it. So, so yeah, and now on to the rest. All right, Charles uh, Jean-Pierre will be presenting his altar soon, so I'll give him a minute if he is not quite ready yet. You good to go? Thank you. Well, All right. We'll bring you to unmute and let us know when you're ready. Oh. Um, but anyways. Um, Hello? Oh. Oh, no. Oh, not. Not, not you, anyone. Not what? you. Not yet. No, no me. No, okay. Later. Later. <laughs> It's uh, <laughs> no, 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 no. Can you, 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 you gotta meet one of them? Love Zoom. We can see you. Yep. We can see both of you. We just need one of them muted. It's okay. 
I think we're fine now. Perfect. We love Zoom. All right. So I'm Charles Philippe Jean Pierre, Haitian American artist, adjunct professor at American University. Um, I'm happy to be here. Uh, my altar is right behind me. I'm going to explain that. Uh, I thought I would be doing this from Haiti. Um, this time of year is a is a really spiritual time. Uh, Fet Gede is uh, what we call it in Haiti. Um, the artwork that you see in my studio is all from Haiti. Um, I'm going to read an excerpt from Consuming the Caribbean by Mimi Shelter, and then I'm going to walk you all through my altar. Does that work for everybody? <laughs> cool. All right. All right. The tropics have long been metaphorically consumed through the colonial imperial travels narratives, fictions, and artistic depictions of far places, lush landscapes, and exotic others. Yet the Caribbean occupies an ambiguous place in the realm of Western imagined geographies. Part partaking of the paranoid fantasies of discovery, Euro-Americans understand of the Caribbean pivot around what Silva Spitta, um, following the Edmundo Diaz has described as a single maniacal political, economic, and discursive opposition, which was repeated at nauseum. This opposition, paradise, hell, noble savages, cannibals, has persisted to this day. But now it reads, friendly natives, hostile guerrillas, the interplay of these two discourses and the consumption of the Caribbean creates a sense of excitement and danger produced through moving closer and distancing, long, longing and horror, touch and recoil. It is both the site of escapist tourism and dangerous terrain of criminals, unstable governments, disease, and desperate boat people. As one of the recent traveler writers ambivalently describes it, the first time I went to Jamaica, I didn't know much about the place beyond a vague impression of pirates, palm trees. And beneath that sense of insensitivity, a lurking voluptuous danger. All right. Um, I wanted to describe, start off by describing um, in creating an altar that depicted this paradise and this place of danger. Um, my altar is right behind me and it's four stories. Um, the ground level is um, the rules for radicals and a French and English dictionary. The second level is the sociology of aesthetics. Um, I have a master's degree from Howard University. And oftentimes our art in the Caribbean is considered folk art, um, primitive art. Um, uneducated art to a certain extent. Um, but through my studies and being a professor, it's always important for me when I'm teaching classical um, artists such as Picasso, Van Gogh, Matisse, I explain to my students that they drew their inspiration from African and Caribbean artists, North African artists. Uh, Matisse in particular, no, Van Gogh in particular, um, drew a lot of inspiration from Japanese art. And there's a huge French Orientalism <laughs> movement uh, that influenced what we consider contemporary art. I'm bringing up these quote unquote dead people or these ancestors because I'm a visual artist and these are the people that I have to look up to uh, or that I was instructed to look up to in uh, 
while studying. Uh, but I think it's just important for us to look up to our ancestors. So we make altars for the Day of the Dead. Um, I don't know if I mentioned earlier, but um, Fet Gede is, is uh, the same time. I wanted to draw a connection between the Caribbean and Latin America as well with this book. Uh, I think when we talk about Latin America, we kind of forget about Haiti. And I'm not sure if it's because of the skin color or the geographical location. Um, it can't be the geographical location because we're on the same island with the Dominican Republic, right? So we're in the same space and place. Um, but sometimes it feels like we're from a whole nother world. And we are from a whole nother world. Um, at this time, at this moment in time, we're tapping into um, a portal of sorts. Um, a portal where we're able to see our ancestors like in the movie Coco. I think a lot of people, um, understanding of portals goes there, but um, we as Haitians, and I'm not representing all Haitians, uh, honor our ancestors and acknowledge our ancestors um, in their words. So this um, port, I was just about to call it a portal, uh, but this altar <laughs> is dedicated to uh, my grandfather, who was a poet of Haitian Dominican descent. Um, he wrote a book on Les Real Fane, uh, the time that passes or the time that dies, um, to my grandmother, Afro-Indigenous from Jacmel, IET, uh, Andre Hilaire, who uh, was very much in tune with her uh, Indigenous side and um, moved to the big city from the country um, in order to start a better life. On my mother's side, this uh, portal or altar is dedicated to uh, Marcel Jean-Pierre, whose family's ancestry um, we can trace back to the 1700s free. Um, and, and his wife, Denise. Um, so let's get into my uh, altar. Does anyone have any questions yet? Because you can see it from a distance right now, but I'm gonna turn the camera on so you can see it up close. But does anybody have any questions so far? I don't see any questions in the chat yet, but I'm sure as you go, somebody will jump. I do have one that I think maybe we can bring up in the end was the point that you brought up, the challenging of our ancestors that you were taught in school when it came to your professional studies of art and to challenge that maybe even that while we're paying honor and respect, that doesn't mean that we can't leave space to potentially challenge that and what that kind of means as far as you know how that has evolved into where we are um but yeah we can maybe that'll be plugged in later but yeah so um i think 2000 for the last three out of four years i've been in haiti in october and um our mythologies or our pantheon as far as vampires and werewolves and all of these things that you think of uh, that are scary in the world, uh, a lot, even pirates to a certain extent, <laughs> uh, have um, origins in the Caribbean. Um, Turtle Island, which the Pirate of the Caribbean um, was based off of, was uh, what we call today Haiti. Um, I believe creating altars, I believe creating altars are, is tapping into your indigeneity. And I believe indigeneity is simply understanding that your existence uh, predates colonialism. I'm gonna say that one more time. I believe altars are us tapping into our indigeneity. And I believe indigeneity is understanding that our existence predated colonialism. 
understanding that, acknowledging that, and embracing that. Um, it's been a journey for me um, in figuring out and finding out uh, where my family is from. Um, how did we move? How did how in touch are we with our quote unquote ancestors? And um, from the light of day, um, I think it's a faux pas almost to a certain extent to be in touch with your ancestors. Um, and not necessarily, I think, in general, uh, in Haitian culture, but like with certain, within certain families, um, Catholicism has been a big thing. Um, so these dates um, line up with um, All Saints Day. So you have Halloween, one extra day, and then All Saints Day. Um, oftentimes what you'll see, Catholicism or countries um, that have been colonized by the Roman Catholic Church that we in incorporated or tied in our traditions to their traditions to make a marriage of sorts, um, a Creole marriage. So without further ado, I feel like I did a good introduction. I went for 15 minutes. <laughs> I'm gonna take you over to the altar and I'll explain it piece by piece. And if you have questions, just let me know and I'll do my best to answer them. Sounds good? All right, thanks. So let's turn this camera around. You got all the angles. All right, so this is the studio and this is the altar. All right, so these cans were collected from Haiti and South Africa. And at the base of, of my altar is Rules for Radicals. Um, and Rules of Radicals is a book um, that kind of speaks to how strategies and tactics that we can use for our liberation. Um, a book that really touches me is Black Skin White Matters by Frantz Fanon, who was a Caribbean author who mastered French language, who felt, or thesis was, the, the more we, we understand um, colonial culture, the better we are able to verbalize our discontent with it. But at a certain point, when you understand the language so much, you can't speak for the people anymore. And you're, to a certain extent, disconnected from the people that you're trying to liberate. So you're stuck in the middle, black skin, white eyes. Um, this book is a kind of a, a toolkit of sorts of liberation. And I felt that this would be important to share. Where there are no men, be thou a man. Let them call me a rebel and welcome. I feel no concerns from it, but I should suffer the misery of devil where I, too, make a whore of my soul. Lest we forget at least an over-the-shoulder acknowledgement to the very first radical from all our legends, mythology, and history, and who is to know where mythology leaves off and history begins, or which is which, the first radical known as man who rebelled against the establishment and did it so effectively that he at least won his own kingdom. Lucifer, um, Saul, Alyssa. All right, so um, Haitians oftentimes are considered devil worshipers. Haitians are often considered uh, uh, 
food and priests, but uh, their connection to their indigenous spiritual practices is what liberated them from um, colonial colonialism. Um, we were, I'm sure everyone knows this, but just in case they don't know this, Haiti was the uh, first independent free black nation in um, the Western Hemisphere. But one thing that I've come to know as I've uh, explored indigeneity more and more here in the Western Hemisphere, we're also the only nation in the Western Hemisphere that still has this indigenous name. So IET means land of many mountains. Um, and when um, the quote unquote uh, freedmen liberated themselves, they used the indigenous name as the name for the country. All right, so on top of the rules of the radical, the rules for radicals, I have a French English dictionary. And what I've found is that in order to speak, can you see? In order to speak to the ancestors, you have to, in order to speak to the ancestors, you have to, kind of speak their language, but in order to speak to the oppressors, you have to speak their language as well. And um, I speak French, I speak English, um, but in Haiti, it's interesting. There is a such thing as Haitian French, um, because we've been pretty disconnected from um, France for uh, centuries now. And then there's also French Creole. Um, so from the outside looking in, it looks like we have two languages in in, in Haiti, which is French, which is Creole, but there's actually four languages. Um, and so mastering the tongue is, is important on the surface, but then I think censoring yourself and just being able to speak to the ancestors without books like this um, are just important, just as important. Um, on the bottom, I wanted this structure to have spaces where air could pass through. Um, and I wanted it to be tiered because there's, there's different levels to our understanding. And so on the basic level, you would think that it's language or certain tactics um, that can uh, tie us to our Liberation. The next tier here, it, the book is Sociology of Aesthetics, and it, it, it represents. Is there an echo? Okay. Um, I often say that Haiti is one of the most beautiful, ugliest places on the planet. These are vessels, they all contain the product or chemical, something that was manufactured at one point. It was uh, consumed, whether it was a oil can consumed by a car or uh, baking powder consumed by a cake. Um, these were all things that were kind of ingested and um, these cans were discarded. Um, they were seen as worthless. Um, they lost their patina, but I, I found a beauty in in this. Um, they also have sharp edges. Um, these are things that um, one would say could cause tetanus or get you sick or don't touch, don't be close to. And I think it's important for us to study those things that like they tell us not to touch and find the beauty in it. Um, I, <laughs> uh, I'm considered a red man in Haiti. Uh, not necessarily a black man, which is interesting, right? Uh, because in this country, it's either black, white, or other, you know? But in Haiti, there's, once again, a breakdown of levels. Like, there's white men, there's yellow men, there's red men, there's black men. Um, and I'm considered a quote-unquote red man. And um, these cans, I feel like, represent, like, those different levels of skin color, those dangerous red or dark things that are sharp, like, Hurt 
Um, this book was uh, in the National Geographic Library when they were, um, I guess, cleaning out their library or getting rid of books. Um, I went and got this and some other books from Antilles. And a lot of the things that we know about the Caribbean, we know about Haiti, Papua New Guinea, and Africa, our ancient selves were filtered through the lenses of photographers and anthropologists that studied in the West. Um, so I have this book represented, um, that represents going from French to now the Caribbean, and then at the top we have Africa here. And this is, uh, this book is called uh, um, African Origin of Civilization, Myth and Reality. Um, that's pretty much it. I wanted, I want to give you guys some time to uh, ask questions. I feel like I talked for uh, 20 minutes straight. Oh, we only have six minutes left. So uh, I'm going to turn back around. All right. That was great. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that, that, I'll, before we open the question, I just want to make like one comment. And the more I learn about my family in Charleston, we were like free people of color for a lot, a large stretch of my Charlestonian family were, were free persons of color. And a lot of their inspiration for slave rebellions or to leave the country was, was from Haiti. Like being a coastal city and being able to get word of the Haitian rebellion, like inspired people in America to fight for freedom. And uh, one of my ancestors I know, when the Civil War came, they left Charleston and went to Haiti and hung out in Haiti until the Emancipation Proclamation. Then they took a boat to New York, enlisted in the Union Army, and then fought for freedom in the U.S. And so it's neat to, you know, growing up, there wasn't a big narrative of the influence of Haiti on my family in like the 1860s and, you know, 50s, but it's pretty evident that it, that it was. And so it's, it's, you know, the connection. Yeah, one comment here from Sam F. from Grits and Gospel. He said, he asked, uh, he kind of dropped, Haiti, isn't Haiti one of the revolutionary innovators? So there you go. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, when you look at where this country is right now and a lot of the very more prevalent conversations that are happening, if people weren't having them before, is this sort of, identity reconciliation situation right like and i think this is why the significance of taking the space to uh kind of find out what your ancestry and we're not talking about just 23 and me unless that really kind of kicks it off right um, but i think if you're a person who is a you know person of color or an immigrant or you know if you come from a family who have you know have experienced genocide or wherever it is that you come from and that's not to say that every person of color has experienced some type of devastation you know we don't want to put a blanket statement on that but um you know you can't just start digging up photos and 23 and me and into, into the records but when it comes to this whole identity crisis and how do you reconcile with that you know and i think starting with your ancestors even if you can find one bit or wherever it is a piece of history that is connected can really kind of get you on that path and going there but does anybody else have any questions? Is there anything else? Um, thank you for taking the time out to listen to me. I can talk about uh, just the artwork that I do outside of these sculptures. Uh, my um, art, my art, uh, kind of focuses in between, I create collages and there's gaps between my collages and the lines or the voids in the gaps represents like, uh, the things you can feel but you can't see, uh, the spiritual realm. And um, I appreciate this opportunity because um, it gave me an opportunity to create a, a 3D structure. Um, I usually deal with, um, 2D um, works, paintings, and collages, and but I enjoy creating installations. So thank you for this opportunity. Oh, thank you. And let me actually close with your bio because 
uh, I was so distracted by your two, your cool two screens, I didn't even read your bio. <laughs> uh, so let me close that out just so people can actually kind of connect a little bit of your work with what you just talked about. Charles Philippe Jean Pierre is a Haitian American artist groomed on Chicago's South Side. His most tangible connections to his Haitian roots were the paintings and sculptures in his family home. He often overheard passionate debates on abuses of power and continual regression in Haiti, but the art that hung on their walls were beautiful contradictions to his homeland's hopeless narrative. The stark contradictions of beauty and power as a theme were ever present as a theoretical and methodological struggle within Jean Pierre's overall body of work. His multimedia paintings speak to the nexus of political, social, and economic structures. I think that really just kind of encapsulates just like your, your work and, and just what you presented to the bio. So hopefully everybody can kind of dig a little bit more into your work and, um, and the nuances of that narrative that you kind of throw out there. Uh, one thing I was really, um, wait, one thing I kind of went throw out there before you say it, when you said, um, Haitia is one of the ugliest, beautiful places. And, you know, that's the same way I feel about Cambodia when I'm there. It's like I smell barbecue and burning trash, and I'm like, oh my God, it's amazing. Yeah. Uh, I was just in Haiti earlier this week, so um, I, I didn't want to come back before this election, but I wanted to, um, I think we're going to be okay. I think we're going to be okay. I'm, I'm hoping the ancestors all come together and help us out for this next week here. <laughs> That's definitely our hope with, with, with this project in many ways. But, uh, but Charles, uh, one last thing I'd like to ask is, you know, this type of creating an altar is a 3D and this is not the art that you do normally. So is there any kind of advice or, you know, you would like to share with other people that are thinking about creating altars, any kind of like th what inspired you to make something different that spoke to you? Because, you know, this is also, it's, we're doing this to hopefully educate other people to take it to the next level. All right. Uh, I forgot something. There's, there's, there's one last thing I needed to do, one important part to the altar. And that was in the pictures, but I'm going to pour a libation for the ancestors that aren't here, and I'll close off there. Uh, but um, this answers your question. Materiality is important. Right, so uh, this bottle comes from Haiti. Um, we're just as much water as we are things that are physical. So I'm just gonna pour some of this out for the ancestors. Um, when you're making an altar, find things that aren't just physically representational of what we are, but um, spiritually. Does that work? Is that a good way to close out? That's perfect. And you guys can think of your ancestors that you want to think of. Uh, send energy to us at four. Ashe. And that's that's a um, a way that we usually open up open up the ceremony is with a pouring of a libation. So. Um, yeah, that's my time. It's 501. <laughs> Perfect. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. All right. Our next, our next artist moving along. And please, if something ever comes to, <laughs> to mind, um, feel free to still throw it in the chat. We will always um, be happy to bring it back up. So our next person is actually sitting next to me. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna go read his, uh, I'm gonna read his bio. Uh, <laughs> she's sitting next to me, so I'll try not to be weird about it. Mr. Eric Brunier, <laughs> a chef and founder of Foreign National, an agent of alternatives, Eric Brunier creates space. Through his Washington DC based concept development company for a national, he offers an alternative food and space as commons. There exists a constant dialogue of community culture in progress. His piece was actually a performance piece called a citizen, a subject inspired by the Cambodian religious holiday. Pjumwon. 
Air Greening's performance art piece pays tribute to the 650 lives lost to COVID-19 in the District of Columbia. Remembrance and honor are paid through a hybrid of motifs pulled from Trump One and the Asian diaspora in the United States. By lighting incense, giving offerings, and inviting viewers to participate, we celebrate cross-cultural identities and unique histories while honoring our ancestors and departed loved ones. So this one's a little bit of a fun one. I'll go ahead and highlight my screen. Let me change this rename here while he... This is only funny because this is actually my roommate slash husband that really wanted to participate. So just to kind of throw some fun here. Um, obviously, uh, you heard the bio, but when he heard about this Alters Project, he, as much as I didn't care for him to participate, he actually really felt called to, to do it. And I really respected that he was interested in participating in this. So um, here we are. Let me go ahead and highlight my screen, this guy behind me. Sorry, all that you have to deal with us. <laughs> Wait, let me make sure I share a screen too. Let me know when you're ready to share a screen, I will help you. <laughs> uh, and thumbs up if you all can hear, okay. <sighs> Would you like to talk with your photos up or? Um, yeah, I'll just say hi everybody and then we'll share the screen and um, I'll talk through the, um, the piece a little bit. Why don't you tell us a little bit of why you wanted to participate in I will, course. I will, let me share the screen. <laughs> as soon as we switch over. How are, we, are we sharing? Yes, yes, yes. Let's see, let's just make sure that your image is up. All right. Everybody see okay? Hear okay? Are the are the photos being shown? All right. You can just go like this as you thank you so much. <laughs> Jeez. Uh hey, what's going on? My name is Eric Brinner Yang. Um I'm a local chef here in Washington, D.C., and um, over the last couple of years, I've been uh, inspired by this other culinary performance artist named Rick Rick, um, and I think like what I started doing as a living, which is to be a chef, started as a form of art that through time has just felt more uh, transactional versus artistic. Um, and so when this the opportunity to do this piece um, arised, I really wanted to try to see, you know, how I could cross what I do for a professional living um, and incorporate it into um, some, some type of ritualistic performance piece. <clears throat> My regular background um, before culinary arts was I was a piano player and a musician. Um, and really wanted to focus on being um, a musical artist. And I always worked in a restaurant um, to be able to do those endeavors. And eventually, you know, I started focusing more on this. So I've been kind of saying that this is really like my first real piece of art um, in over a decade. And so it was a lot of fun um, to be able to try to think um, in a different manner about what I'm doing. Um, also at the same time, um, the act of performing the ritual um, uh, allowed me to start figuring out like what its meaning was. So I'm Taiwanese American, my wife's Cambodian American, and a lot of this piece is representative of like the journey a little bit of our relationship. I'm not particularly religious um, and in my own Chinese household, we didn't really partake in very many Chinese cultural rituals, um, but Zeta does. Um, and I think she does it as a form of preserving um, her culture, speci specifically Khmer culture, um, which has, um, is really done through um, storytelling and spoken storytelling because of the Khmer Rouge. So 
you know, I think like a little bit of what we do, what I've done in this piece is pull from kind of the experience of learning about her cultural rituals um, into what this is. So the in mid-October, which kind of the timing of this piece, there's a, a Cambodian religious holiday called Pachum Bun, which um, translates, a, a bun kind of translates to um, ball or rice ball. And in this holiday, you go to the temple and you make offerings to the different ghosts to be able to speak to your um, ancestors that have passed. And so typically one of my favorite part of this festival is just this community of Cambodian Americans getting together, celebrating their history and their loved ones, and then sharing a, a communal meal. Um, because of COVID-19 and the, ability, the inability for people to say goodbye to their loved ones, um, we wanted to do this piece kind of all kind of collecting all of it, spending this time in this ritual, honoring those who have passed um, because that, that opportunity wasn't afforded to them. So I'll walk you, we did this performance piece on Thursday. We started roughly around 11 o'clock. Uh, we finished around 7 p.m. Um, and we provided an offering to each life that had passed culminating to a total of 650 offerings. Um, and then we also had a crowd participation format that I think we have some pictures of. So if people came and asked what we were doing, we were able to engage them into the ritual. Um, and I thought that was um, super fun. The piece is called A Citizen, A Subject. This is based a little bit on my conversation with Barrett we had uh, before my performance piece. Um, but, you know, as a citizen of this country, um, our nation has the obligation to protect us um, and to provide us health and safety. And if not, which is currently the case, then are we just its subjects? So that's why my piece is called that. So first we started um, getting, uh, doing, we got the rice together. We started building up the altar. So essentially what we did is we had this bowl. We would make a rice ball um, for the food offering and then light the incense for the prayer. And this is kind of us going through that. And then we would lay them all out on the floor. We originally had a carpet, um, but it was very lumpy. Um, so it was making the, uh, making the, <laughs> slowing down the project a little bit. You know, didn't really want to put it just straight on the straight floor, but is what it is. This is my daughter who was helping me in the performance. So here you see a gentleman in a yellow hat. Uh, this is where we talk about the crowd participation a little bit. Um, because I'm not a deep, rich historian in every detail of Pachumban, and also not a really deep historian or have a lot of familiarity with Chinese um, ancestral blessings. Um, but I kind of, when I talk about the piece in the, um, the introduction that Zeta did, um, it's really about kind of pulling from what I know that I've seen other families do in the Asian American diaspora. So uh, if you were uh, someone just walking through the space or the piece and asked what was going on, I would ask you to participate. And over here we had a, a little stack of fake money. Um, and in Chinese culture, if you pass and you do your blessings for your ancestors, you basically would burn everything that you would want to send to them. Um, so here we would burn them money so they could have good fortune and in their afterlife. So this gentleman's writing a, a name of someone that's close to him that's passed. Um, and then he would light it, the candle next to the bowl and then burn it in the bowl. And then we would make also a corresponding uh, rice ball for him. Um, and so that his loved one would have money and food in the afterlife. I can, my wife's eyes are staring at me. Um, so then we started kind of building it out and using a lot of the uh, floral arrangements that I would typically see at the temple. Barrett could attest to that because he actually went to Pachumban with us, which was really cool. But we used a lot of um, white flowers, which in Chinese culture um, you, would, you would use for a funeral. Um, and then yellow flowers, which I just love. It just kind of reminds me of all the clothes and stuff all the monks are wearing. 
We're currently performing, in this piece, we're performing it at my restaurant, Maketo. We were gonna do it in the courtyard um, there. We have an outdoor space, but it happened to be raining that day. Here's another gentleman who is uh, partic uh, participating in the piece by writing a loved one on, a, on the money. There's my wife supporting me in my performance piece. balls in and out. This is as it continues to grow in size. And I think right here we're lighting the last incense of the piece. And then here's the finished altar uh, that we completed around 6.30, 7 o'clock um, with 650 plus offerings to um, those who've passed of COVID in our district. Um, and uh, this was the kind of like final setting piece of the piece. There you go, that's my altar. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna stop my share. Or should I leave it up? Can they see me? They see me and the? Well, they definitely hear your voice. Oh, okay. <clears throat> How did it make you feel? Um, I'm definitely not the type of person that is like very vocal about how I process or do things. Um, everything I've done in my life is really about the ritual of the exercise. The exercise and the ritual creates the emotion and the feeling. That's the very similar pattern to being a musician where you practice, you might create something, but you practice it basically over and over again until the either the piece or the emotion of it is gone and it just becomes muscle memory. That's the same with cooking. And I felt like at some point that was the same with this art project is like you have this very ambitious feeling um, that you're trying to evoke um, and the ritual of it essentially uh, turns it into something that's kind of either concrete or something that's very coherent for people to understand. I think previously talking about this, you just have a idea of what you're trying to evoke, but you don't really know what it is, but the ritual of doing it over and over again, it, it ends up becoming something very powerful but not necessarily to myself, but to the people that are viewing it. Because at one, at some point in time, you're really just doing the action of the ritual and only really focusing on that and letting other people experience what it might ultimately mean. So I think that that's what end up, ended up happening. We have a question from the audience here, from <coughs> Julie Jimenez. How much and what kind of research did you do to prepare, prepare for this piece? Um, <laughs> well, this is the uh, first art piece I've done in a very long time. Um, and really, uh, in preparation for the piece, uh, I wanted to do some basic research just to make sure that, like, especially if I'm using Puch uh, Puchumbun as the general inspiration, that I can speak to it about a little bit. But, you know, I think... It, the, the, the Cambodian holiday itself is so rich in hundreds of years of Buddhist religion, um, and it's just very in-depth. So what I took from it was just like what my personal experience of it was, being married to Zeta, um, and being able to transform what I've seen of the holiday at the temple into this particular piece. And then the rest is really just about kind of the natural in, intrinsic feeling. It just like, does this feel right? Does this feel authentic? Um, and does it feel honest and really going from there? I definitely wouldn't be a historian of like the elements of every single thing because it really wasn't about the elements. It was really about the ritual of performing and doing this for people that, you know, weren't able to 
have this done for them, um, which was why we did it. Thank you. Scoot over. Okay. Are we sharing? <laughs> Are, we can, sharing? We Are we sharing? Okay. Well, you know what? This kind of um, rolls over into um, a little bit about just sort of that getting back to the roots and taking some time to learn a little bit about our ancestry, right? Um, for you, it's, uh, you know, this is not something that you grew up with, but it's something that I grew up with. And when I have brought up this holiday with some of my peers who are the same generation, who are either 1.5, which we call from the refugee um, community that came here right after the Cambodian genocide, or the second generation would be me, so I'm actually born here. I was kind of surprised to learn that a lot of my peers didn't actually know about this holiday. And I know a lot of my peers also aren't um, regular attendees of going to the temple for a lot of these holidays. Um, I was still very surprised that a lot of them didn't even know that this particular one even really existed. And as we kind of started having this conversation, um, you know, a lot of them, uh, of my Cambodian American peers kind of were thinking like, wow, it would have been really, it was sort of like a, a space that they kind of wish that they had um, to participate in, to go to the temple. Um, that wasn't so connected to the, the, the Buddhist aspect that they weren't familiar with, but the actual practice of it could have really returned something for them on a spiritual level. Um, and I think what's interesting too with him doing this, and then actually my daughter, our daughter actually, um, ended up participating in is, you know, what do we choose to take when it comes to these ancestral and uh, traditions um, and our heritage? What, do we, what are we choosing to take from this and carry on that, you know, some of us who are here and kind of uh, taking what we, we felt really connected to with these practices and what we didn't feel as connected to, what are we now choosing to take on for that next generation? So those are just some of the really interesting things about that, that, you know, for you, you're kind of taking it in. And then now for my daughter, that's a whole other thing. You know, yeah. there's a saying that is to be, to be Khmer is to be Buddhist. We, there's like the Buddhism that people are familiar with the practices um, and, and the different sects of it. And then there's the Cambodian cultural Buddhism, which is a whole other thing. Maybe we'll do another event and conversation about that. But, um, you know, that's, you know, my daughter is Cambodian. She's going to take some of these practices and traditions um, that are connected to her identity of being a Cambodian. Obviously, I wouldn't impose that. But, you know, for, uh, for me, for us, you know, we're still trying to figure out what those those pieces are yeah I thought I think like um, one you know it just kind of been was happenstance that our daughter was happened to be at Maketa when we were doing the piece because um, turned out she had a doctor's appointment and they came to Maketa while I was doing the piece and then she just started joining it definitely wasn't like a planned experience and then also you know Zeta and I really didn't talk much about my piece not because she didn't want me to talk to her about her piece, but because that's not necessarily my process. I didn't actually want to talk to him about this piece because I wanted it to be a surprise and yeah. completely disconnected. Um, and I think, you know, and not without like intention, because we did kind of drive around trying to find a, a massive Buddha for the altar. Um, but like a very specific one that we couldn't find. But then when we couldn't find, when I couldn't find one, it was kind of like, you know, it's not really needed because I think as an expression of myself um, and even where we had planned on doing the piece, which is Maketo, is that like I try to be not outwardly about my culture and it's more of an inward process thing. Um, and and I think it's always been that, that way because, you know, I'm, I'm half Chinese and half um, white and don't really have a connection to my birth father. So like how I process like what's important to my own, what's important to the, my Asian heritage is always just kind of been picked and choose for me. And then specifically for Maketo in terms of it being an Asian inspired restaurant, we always intentionally wanted to make sure that that place had an intrinsic cultural feeling without there being any real cultural motifs 
um, anywhere in the space. So, at, at, you know, a lot of these little layers that kind of happened into the piece kind of been like <clears throat> honest um, uh, assessments of who I am as a person that on accident kind of just happened to be a part of the piece. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you for participating. So, so, can, I, like, can I add something real quick? Yeah, go. So first, first of all, like, I'm the words philosopher guy. And the point of this is to see how like ideas that I've been thinking of get manifested in ways that I couldn't have ever like imagined. And it's just so wonderful to see that with with Eric's and, 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 and CJP's work where like it's it's what I would have hoped, but I couldn't have even thought about it because like I focus on on language so much. But I want to say that the, the idea of like citizen and subject that Eric brought up is like so profound and we don't think about this that much. But like in France, when it came time to like have a revolution, the people needed to come up with like a new identity for themselves because up until that point, they were just subjects of the king. If you just lived in that country, you were a subject, there weren't citizens. And so when they had to redefine themselves to transcend an oppressive structure, they looked to the Greeks and the citizens, which just means, you know, people of the city. And they said, we're gonna define ourselves with this. And we're not people that live to be subjected by other people. We're people who are citizens and we live here and we, and by that we have these rights and this and and this like this the notion of being able to live as more than just a subject of somebody else is key to human existence and keeping your traditions alive and and having a culture that's not being destroyed or subjected to, to somebody else's ideas and i just thought that was like putting that all together was just so wonderful um but i'd like to kick it to the next artist right now and this next artist, um, his name is Edwin Sanchez, and he is—he's indigenous from Mexico. So he's—he's a Nahuatl—he's Nawa, and he speaks Nahuatl. And when I did my first altar at my house, I—I I know Edwin through through my roommate, partner, spouse, Andrea, and he—he uh, he came to the house, and he—he he made sure that we had the indigenous traditions of the you know the descendants of the Aztecs who have been doing this in Mexico for you know hundreds thousands of years and he came and and, and helped us and so he's here to talk about um, altars and traditional Mexican altars and so I'm just introducing Edwin he's a chef he lives in New York too and so a lot of his work uh, is about connecting food and other like ancestral components into your altar and keeping your culture alive. Uh, so let me let Edwin know he's, it's time for him to come on and we're ready to go. Uh, so, so Edwin did his restaurant. Oh, here we go. Hey, Edwin. Hey, how are you? I'm good, man. So, so let's, I, I told them a, a bit about you. Um, and so please share some, some wisdom about, you know, the altar and, and, and I know, I know. <laughs> Thank you for the wisdom. Thank you. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, we are in the Manhattan under the volcano. This is the name of the place. But the, first, this is the little offering I have. Small, I'll show you later. But I want to talk about it. It's uh, mostly about the um, the the elements we have in the altar, because mostly everybody puts uh, put uh, a little papel picado, little skeletons, little you know papers, and the original um, from from the uh, the ancestors <clears throat> is put some food in, in the altar. I don't have any of those elements I mentioned before, a picado or something like that, more commercialized. I put more food than something else because um, the uh, the food we, I have in the altar, it has a high value nutritional. And therefore, as they are sacred, 
because um, many of those uh, um, offerings, especially ones we call was something, they almost get lost because the precision they tried to to eradicate the, the plant was something. Uh, it has a high value nutritional and and they used to be uh, highly like you know oh, it's a, the cultivation used to be on the high altitude because they don't want to uh, they want to show to the uh, government to, to have the the um the plant was something and that's why it's very important because i remember when the mother have a baby after they need to to have a good meal so they used to make a meal out of the wasontly to get a nutritious nutrients for the mother to have a good milk so that's a very value plant for the civilization that's why they, they choose to have these plants to or these are meals meal or food to be sacred because they they high value nutrition not because i like this color has to be um uh, sacred now they choose it one of each element because the value nutrition i'm gonna show you right now and this is a very um Um, okay, I'll show you this. Uh, this is um, can I have a flash tip? Yeah. All right, you guys coming with the flash. First thing we have mezcal. Mezcal is from the plant, and the name mezcal. We have many type of mezcal is, and the name mezcal means uh, true. Mezcal means melawak. Melawak in Spanish can decir verdad. Verdad means true. So that's one of the means. And the second one is this. Uh, it's a pinole. It's the ground corn toast. I just ready to go. And that's a one element very important for the culture. Even the um, raramuris or taramaras, they run. They known for, for good runners. They they do a lot of ultra marathons, and the meal for energy drink is this one. And this is another element very important. Is it cacao? What is peanuts? Peanuts. Peanuts has has value nutritional, but also because of that, they use as some money for the day. So I remember. When they put the offering, they just throw the money like this everywhere for the for the dead. They throw the money, so it's a very simple uh, for, for the dead, the money. And this also looks like tortilla, but the inside has a beans. So you see, it's kind of dark, little beans, because um, it's also to go. Everything here is to go, even this uh, pumpkin seed. Roast and salt, and they're very important for the uh, nutritional value for uh, vitamins and proteins. Even if you go, and this is we call shikamat. This is uh, we call like a jicama in Espanol. Maybe you know this one, in many supermarket, but this going to the because it's on the ground, it's a root, it's very important. It's come from the mother earth. That's you choose one. And also, it's like uh, you travel a lot, you grab one of these, it's like a water for you. And this is what I'm talking about. The wasonte. The wasonte plant. This, this plant has a high value nutrition. It's almost like a meat without, uh, it's like a meat, like iron, uh, has also potassium and uh, how do you call calcium for the mothers. And that plant they use for that one. And it's very important 
And I like this plant because it's like a resilient, even survive the, the eradication of the plant from the acquisition, prohibition. If you get killed, if, you, if they find you have this uh, plant in, in the backyard in the time of um, the acquisition and the 60th century, but it still survive and now it's coming back. It's the same, like, uh, that's why I like this plant a lot symbolic of resistance of indigenous and that's why it's uh, very precious for me <laughs> and and this is the flor de muerto very simple but the smells help relax to yourself and also now i want to say about the the offering uh the importance of offering it's not only put food for the dead when i did all of this, I think about uh, my family who passed away in the pandemic. And the offering I offered for them, I did make the food, thinking about them is the, is the way to, to release myself, the old feelings I had, you know, I, I don't know how to express myself uh, because they all, they all gone. I didn't see them. But the only way to spread myself, heal myself, is put the offering. Every time I put uh, tortillas or the pumpkin seed or the plant, I, I said the name who pass away and I put something. Every time I put something, uh, part of the food, I said the name. So this is the, for me, is the reason to put the, the offering to heal myself. Not only for decoration, but like a festival, put some skulls, con papel picado, and that's the holiday. It's not a holiday, it's more like a healing, personal healing. Every one of uh, us in a court of the indigenous tradition. You may have different uh, ideas, but that's the main tradition I had for my ancestors. And also, that's the only I have. Right now, very simple. I don't have a lot of like complex stuff, but I want to show the exact value of each plant. And I said again, the wasote is the strongest plant, even almost gone from uh, Inquisition, but it's still here. The same like indigenous, it's still strong and it's still here. Thank you. Thank you, Gwen. <laughs> no, thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that. And I still remember when you were at our house and you 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 cooked for us for Day of the Dead and you talked about how when you were making the food, you thought about your ancestors, you thought about your family. And and it really it 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 touched me when you told me that back then. And it also made me think about how like so much of our time in America we eat like processed food. And the food that we make isn't necessarily like a recipe that someone has passed down. You don't think about someone as you eat something. You think about the microwave, or you know, you, you think about some sort of contraption and how how much something is lost when you don't have that cultural narrative of just food that you can then through Day of the Dead use that narrative to continue their memory and pass it on. So I I think I really appreciate that you shared that, and I think it also shows people that your altar can be quite simple. It doesn't have to have all the commodified stuff that people think Day of the Dead is supposed to have today to have meaning. So, uh, thank you so much for sharing that. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you for uh, for the invitation. Yeah. It's nice to see you. Yeah, likewise, <laughs> man. Well, hopefully you'll be back down here and you know you'll cook, you'll cook something. And but uh, yeah, does anybody have any questions for you? <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing. And it, it really kind of shows that food is, is food and I mean, our food in, a, in itself can be form and it's, it's such a vehicle to sharing these uh, symbolic pieces of like cultural um, practices and food and remembrance is just sort of something that like, I thought of, when, you know, you had told me about Jeff Edwin's work and piece and sort of his connection and how important Dia de los Muertos was to him, is to him. Um, but, you know, food, just just also with Kimbo's, you know, certain dishes are, have to be made for certain holidays and certain traditions. And I 
I that so I'm, I'm just really glad that he was able to share and walk through all of the dishes and the ingredients and kind of what that represented um, to his altar. And I also liked the importance of thinking about your you put healthy food, you put food that nurtures you, you so that it nurtures them in the afterlife. And the notion of peanuts was great because like you they maybe you just don't need to spend money. And so yeah. something that's like the healthiest thing is now the new currency. And and so you, you give you give peanuts. Um, and so I just thought that was such a great concept. And so thanks for sharing everything. Um, yeah, I mean, just the act of cooking, taking an ingredient, uh, going through the process of the recipe, uh, that in itself is so therapeutic. And, you know, when you think of a traditional form of, you know, what our, what our answer is, probably after you did, you know, apart from taking the time to snap a photo of it and going to the store and getting it, but how much more rooted it was back um, back then for our ancestors to actually, you know, um, create an altar from create, from pulling an ingredient and creating the food and you know, taking the time to light the candle. All of that was so much more ritualistic and hopefully it kind of makes us think a little bit about um, what that, what we can do to kind of create that. Yeah. Well, so I believe we 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 have time to go to the the next artist. If anyone has any questions for for Chef Edwin, this would be the great time to ask. But you know, I really I still drop them in. Yeah, drop them into the chat, and we'll we'll ask them on your behalf. Uh, but yeah, it's it's it was really great that you shared what you shared, and that we get to learn that because I'll I'll also say one thing that is is really important is when we talk about Day of the Dead in America, the, co the conversation is always about cultural appropriation in the right way. And so I know I've always appreciated Edwin being able to share some information with me to make sure that I, I do it uh, or as respectfully as possible and you know having him share that. So when we partake in our own traditions while we're doing it on the time that's more commonly associated with Day of the Dead now, to have an indigenous voice in the space is really important. So we make sure that that doesn't get lost or forgotten in the narrative. Yes, thank you. Um, we're kind of gearing up towards the end, but we have a really important piece that's kind of gonna take us to a really um, calming, um, insightful way of closing out the event is, is some readings and we wanna welcome Angela Spring, hi. Thumbs up if you. Hello, here. I'm here. I'm here. <laughs> Welcome. Thanks for joining us. Um, so, Miss Angela Spring, this is the first time we've actually seen each other's faces, by the way. I know. It's been so long. The last time I saw you was totally moly. Was totally oh, <laughs> like, that's totally right. Moly. <laughs> way, way forever ago. And um, Simone is like, you need to know this person. I appreciate what you do. So, for everybody who's not familiar, um, Angela String is the founder of Duende District, a bookshop curated for and by people of color. And she's going to lead us um, through an open mic um, for some, how do I pronounce it? Is it Samhan? Uh, Shaman. Uh, it's what my husband tells me, who is oh, very, very Irish, so I'll just <laughs> trust him. Um, yeah, no, no, so it's, it's Shaman, and we're going to celebrate. It's Thank the you. new year. <laughs> Yeah, tell us a little bit about the practice. So I can't, I, I, it's something that I have always been aware of, but I'm actually um, kind of new to, but it is, it is um, a, some, a lot of people consider it the Wiccan New Year, um, but it's really celebrated. It's the closing of the season. Um, and it basically, uh, it's also the time for us just, just like with Dia de los Muertos, to honor our ancestors, honor our dead, um, to build altars. Uh, and it's, it's cross-cultural in many ways. Um, it's not just Wiccan. Uh, and so, yeah, so it, 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 I think you guys have been talking a lot about these cultural traditions, and it's very much that. It's just a way to honor and make sacred space. And we have a really powerful one this year. This is this the first um, day of the second full moon, uh, which is called the blue moon. And it's very rare. Uh, our first 
moon was the harvest moon on October 1st. So uh, this, I've been going around going, it's a double portal month. <laughs> Because the uh, so if you th see like energies are like really crazy and everything just seems to be like ah and people just suddenly start melting down um, that that's it, that's that energy right now so for me I'm actually in a very calm state I'm like really vibing on on the energy right now um, of the blue moon but I think the last one that the last blue moon was 1944 um, so I think. I think it's something that you only see once in your lifetime. So it's special and it's important. And so this is a really wonderful one to, to celebrate. So thank you, Setup, for inviting uh, Duende District. And I'm so excited that we're partnering with you, not only as a bookstore, but also with this. Don't forget uh, to go to her website and buy, and buy some books. Yeah, buy books, buy books. Um, good, yeah, but Duende District is at Shopkeepers and hopefully we'll, we'll keep doing that and it's a selected list by Seta herself so I'm, I'm excited about that I, I love that every 20 district is very unique to each business that we partner with it's one of my joys so um, yeah I hope you guys check that out um, so this is going to be very laissez-faire I had one technical sign up but I, I want it to be something I'm going to start us off um, I'm a poet and for me uh, the language of poetry has always been something that is my, I've considered very sacred and religious in many ways. Um, and so when I think about, I have my own altar that, that set up that I have, uh, my husband has, is honoring his ancestors. I don't know if you can see it. It's like, oh, I've got to do the altar. <laughs> um, there's my altar. Uh, it's not fancy. I have to do it at the kitchen table because I have a toddler in an open space house. <laughs> uh, I'm coming to you guys from Albuquerque, New Mexico, by the way. Uh, that's where I am currently and also where I'm from. Uh, so you can see I've got my candle with my family um, in one. I've also got Sorry, I muted myself on accident. Uh, anyway, so I, yeah, I'm, so I'm honoring my Panamanian, Puerto Rican, um, indigenous, and I also have West African. I'm trying to honor as many of my ancestors as I can. And then my husband is very mostly Irish. And so his candle uh, is honoring, or honoring his. And I also have um, Celtic ancestry. So I kind of put like in the middle there where we meet in the middle, but I have many things that are rep, uh, for my own, uh, for example, I, I am not Catholic. Uh, I have a lot of issues with Catholicism, but because I've been trying to come to terms with my own ancestry and the fact that, you know, you have ancestors who were both oppressed and oppressor, um, you know, Catholicism played a large strain in my family. And so I wanted to be able to honor them. And I remember that I have a bond with La Virgen de la Guadalupe. And so I, you know, I wanted to, to always honor her as well, but also honor, for example, the Morrigan, who is a goddess, a Celtic goddess that I've always had an affinity with, um, as well as honoring the storyteller and spider woman who I've always had an affinity as well. So I don't know if you can see my storyteller that was given to me that I love that's been with me for a long time. Um, and then I've got some pictures of um, my abuelo. Um, and, and so yeah, so this, and this is my normal altar that I kind of pray at every day. So that's my altar. <laughs> um, and I, I try to honor my ancestors every day. I, you know, I draw tarot and um, really just try to learn more about myself. Um, and it's been a deep dive, especially since becoming a mother, which I think anybody who's become a parent has really, you suddenly become very aware that you are one of many in your line. And so it's, it's been a very transformative thing for me. So I want to um, start us off with a poem from one of my favorite poets, and it's a poem that I've read many times over the years, uh, and it's Joy Harjo. And she is our current US Poet Laureate, which is glorious, but I've been in love with her since I've been an undergrad. I've met many, many authors and poets over the years, but every time I meet Joy Harjo, <laughs> 
I always turn into an idiot. <laughs> like, I remember meeting, I met her once. She went to uh, the University of New Mexico and I did as well. And I met her in our department and I shook her hand and I was just like, you're everything to me. <laughs> but this is a poem that um, when I talk about the release of language and the power of poetry and the power of the storytellers, I always go back to Joy Harjo. And so I highly encourage you, if you haven't experienced her poetry or even her memoir, Crazy Brave is Beautiful, um, to definitely do that. But this is a, I'm being joined by my son. <laughs> um, sorry. Honey, could you? My husband has fallen down on his job. <laughs> uh, anyway, so I love this poem. I read this poem a lot before a lot of my own readings. Um, and I thought it was a beautiful way to honor this particular holiday and season and time when I think we're all hoping that we're going to be able to create a new world. And people are waking up. So this poem is called I Give You Back. I release you, my beautiful and terrible fear. I release you. You were my beloved and hated twin, but now I don't know you as myself. I release you with all the pain I would know at the death of my children. You are not my blood anymore. I give you back to the soldiers who burned down my home, beheaded my children, raped and sodomized my brothers and sisters. I give you back to those who stole the food from our plates when we were starving. I release you, fear because you hold these scenes in front of me and I was born with eyes that can never close. I release you, I release you, I release you, I release you. I am not afraid to be angry. I am not afraid to rejoice. I am not afraid to be black. I am not afraid to be white. I am not afraid to be hungry. I am not afraid to be full. I am not afraid to be hated. I am not afraid to be loved, to be loved, to be loved, fear. Oh, you have choked me, but I gave you the leash. You have gutted me, but I gave you the knife. You have devoured me, but I laid myself across the fire. I take myself back, fear. You are not my shadow any longer. I won't hold you in my hands. You can't live in my eyes, my ears, my voice, my belly, or in my heart. My heart, my heart, my heart. But come here, fear. I am so alive, and you are so afraid of dying. All right. So I have one person who definitely signed up. Um, and let me, I don't know if Sunny is here. Sunny, you are here. Wonderful. So I, um, I definitely want to welcome up Sunny to share a little bit. We have, I don't know if there's gonna be more people after this. Um, we'll only have about uh, 10 minutes, so hopefully we can keep it to around three, four minutes, but. Sunny James? Yes, yeah, Sunny James. And I see, I see her in my screen. No, I'm put her up. Fantastic, welcome. Oh, she's muted. I just asked her to unmute. Okay. Okay. Unmute myself. There. Uh, I was going to read a a, a, a short excerpt from um, a manuscript that I've been working on. Um, and my vision has been really hinky the last uh, 24 hours. So I am going to pass on, this is a manuscript um, born out of um, my 25 years of genealogy. And so when I saw um, the altars, because I, I have a very deaf, so I hope you don't mind if I don't read anything, but um, I, I do have this bit from, from Cicero, um, which I feel very strongly about and I, I post from time to time. Um, to be ignorant um, of what occurred before you were born, to remain always a child. For what is the worth of human life unless it is woven into the history of our ancestors by the records of history? Um, and I, 
I've been doing my family's genealogy for, like I said, 25 years. And this manuscript I've been working on incorporates the history, um, the genealogical history that came um, out of um, my family's life. Um, and I guess when I saw the altar, I, I realized that my own altar, which is back there, um, and um, a bit of a lot of DNA work and um, was altars were this outpouring of um, my genealogy work because that's what an altar is to me. And there may be some folks who disagree with me. Sorry, there's the camera. Um, there may be some folks who disagree with me, but my altar was an outgrowth of of my genealogy research. And so for Black folks in particular, we don't have that, um, that, that tradition. And that made me sad. It, it, it really did. Um, and so I said, I'm going to break with tradition and, you know, died in the wool Southern Baptist and in, include all that I am. I think I was trying to, to get to all that I am, all that came to be inside of me. Because when I did the research and when I did the DNA, there was Asian, there was African, there was European, there was Irish, there was this melange, this mixture of stuff. And to just embrace one aspect of it seemed to lessen me and my ancestors. And I didn't want them lessened at all. So. I am sorry, I, 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 like I said, I don't, it would not be a good reading opportunity <laughs> because my, my vision is, is not quite the, the best today. But I did want to share that. I encourage everyone to, to pursue, however large or small, an altar, whatever honor you can give your ancestors. They will guide you, they will hold you up, they will direct you. Um, they, they, they play such a large role in my life um, that I, I wrote 200 and some odd thousand words about it. <laughs> so thank you, Angel, for the opportunity. Again, I apologize for um, not being able to, to see properly to give an enjoyable reading. Thank you so much, Sunny. No, I'm so, I'm so happy you shared that you and I so think it's very much something that we needed to hear and I agree um and, and I also like you know I too am a beginning alter person and I'm trying to figure it out and and I think but I think it's important as well that you know whatever it is I, I do you know um I'm learning more about intuitive magic and um and and how to uh follow your intuition which they've taught us not like, you know, the you know, colonization has, has tried to strip from us. And so when well, using that intuition, it, I mean, it sounds like you're strongly using your own intuition and that's a beautiful thing. You're absolutely right. You called that. Does anybody else want to share with us? Uh, you, you can type in the chat me or, you know, um, let, just let us know because I think we have to unmute you. Um, We've just got that. Oh, yeah. I'll just chime in as you know, one of the hosts. I think to kind of carry on what Sunny was saying is that for many like African Americans, this process of altar creation, it's like it's a process of exploration where we're not sure what the template is, what 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 should it look like, what even what are the things that should be on it, like who are all the people, like. How do I find out if I'm excluding or telling the whole complex narrative? Like it's a whole new type of exploration. And I think, you know, a lot of people in America have a similar dynamic. Clearly it's not the same, it's different, but there's this, there's a newness and a, and a rawness to figuring out how to adequately do this while not taking something from somebody else um, or not feeling as though you're telling someone that they have to do it one way and this is the right way. And so, like, I think this, you know, my goal with this project is to hopefully create that space where people can kind of share and feel more comfort and strength in what they're, they're making. And, you know, at, at a personal level, like, it's all helpful for me, too, because I, 
I stay in my head a lot and I'm getting into the heart to figure out how to like actually construct all of the, the work. So seeing, you know, what people have, have developed is quite helpful. And so I, I appreciate you sharing, you know, the, the, your journey to figure out what, um, what yours should look like and acknowledging that like, there's not really a, a perfection. It's, it, it, it grows and changes every single year and we're learning how to, how to make it better. Uh, if better is a thing, you know, but like as authentic as possible with each passing year. And so hopefully you will um, be able to share your manuscript at some point if it's if something you're comfortable with when it's when it's ready yeah sunny we can't wait we can't wait to read it sunny has been a, a supporter of the district since the beginning and i am so excited to see her here today yeah I, I appreciate you know your contribution angela too and um you really kind of pushing the importance of words and books and and really what, what you wanted to bring to the table today with just oral, store, oral stories. Um, and that's how our ancestors used to share stories, right? And you know, I think if we come from a background where either pieces of it has been destroyed and you know, we're counting and, the, and people who have held those stories are no longer here to pass them on. You know, it's, it's up to us to take these moments to kind of, it, you know, now would be the time to go seek that out. Now would be the time to maybe recreate it, reclaim it, whatever it is um, that will, you know, fit those puzzle pieces together. Absolutely. Um, this is actually so important to me because in in uh, Pueblo culture, uh, which is where what I grew up around, uh, you know, it is it's representative of that oral tradition and how important it is. And you know, you think about. <sighs> One of, one of Duende District's things that we say is decolonize your mind. And even when I, when I you know, started Duende District and, and, and started down that path, I didn't even realize how deep it meant, how deep it needed to go because how deeply embedded in, in us you know, are, are all of these you know, oppressive colonization. And, and it's, it really actually took <laughs> giving birth and having yet another traumatic experience for it to even open up even further. And, and it changes your worldview, it changes your worldview, but it's a, it's a frightening thing to really reach out and try to search for your ancestors and their voices, all of them. Um, but it's also a very freeing one. And so, and, and just like, um, you know, Barrett and Sunny are talking about where, especially when you don't have something to fall back on and you need to trust your own inner voice and the voices of your ancestors who are speaking to you, that's okay. You got to do, you know, just because we're not rooted in, we've been taken away from or, or you know, had those parts of our culture um, taken from us in one aspect or another, they don't want us to have it and they don't want us to reconnect with it. And so the reconnecting with it in, in any way that we can is very powerful. This is how we wake up. And this is how we reclaim and create a new world. Thank you. Thank you. 100%. Um, I think that's a good way to, 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 to end for the day. Don't you think, Seda? Yeah, I know we're here. So um, hopefully everybody felt like they were able to take something away from today. Um, and join us for tomorrow because again we have two days of this and every every day is gonna you know gear towards something different of what alters hopes to kind of put out there so tomorrow's topic is third culture generation intersectionality of traditions and identity which i think a little bit touched on today but we really wanted to emphasize the traditions and the sort of the roots and the foundation today and then tomorrow we'll really kind of get into the intersectionality of it all you know what does it mean to us today what are we pulling when we talk about um, the spirits of these traditions and what does that mean to us and what we choose to take away and and does that contradict a little bit of who we are today and in our culture and the context that we live in um so please join in tomorrow same time 4 p.m everybody who participated today um who spoke today we will share this information with you if you've registered to the event right it will be emailed up to you Sorry, I don't want to ramble, if, close off if you wanted to say something there. No, I just wanted to say everything Seda said is, is correct and makes sense. And, you know, if you 
uh, enjoyed this event and want to support the work, please go to our website, SCL.community, and, you know, uh, contribute to help us keep on doing this type of work. And we have a great lineup tomorrow and, and on Monday. So we hope to see you guys, um, you know, later on. And that, that's really it. So, yeah, I think that, that covers it. Thank you all. Thanks. Have don't a look at reading. I'm just joking. I don't know if it's frowned upon, so don't do it. <laughs> but have a great rest. Of, and, and also tomorrow, Les will be here. And so there'll be musical intro and outros. Our DJ's coming back. And so that's key. Um, you know, DJ's music, art, everything. So have a great evening. Have a great evening. Bye-bye.